insulin, glucagon, and diabetes are discussed in this screencast. You may find information on these topics in Chapter 9 of your textbook. This screencast was designed to achieve the following objectives. For insulin and glucagon, describe the following. Stimulus of secretion, chemistry, whether it's hydrophilic or hydrophobic, target tissue and effect, and how the hormones are regulated. Describe type 1 and type 2 diabetes, and list the long-term consequences of untreated diabetes mellitus. The pancreas is an endocrine organ, and like many endocrine organs, it has functions not associated with its release of hormones. In fact, 99% of the pancreas is actually involved in the production of digestive juices, which are secreted into the small intestine. The blue glands, or the glands that are color-coded in blue, are actually exocrine glands, which secrete digestive enzymes into a duct, and the duct takes those digestive enzymes to the small intestine. The other 1% of the pancreas is composed of endocrine glands, specifically pancreatic islets, color-coded in pink. Some of these cells are beta cells, which release insulin, and other cells of these islets are alpha cells, which release the hormone glucagon. We will now discuss further these two hormones, insulin and glucagon. Let's first talk about insulin. So insulin is often referred to as the hormone of feasting, and that's because it's released when glucose and other nutrients are in abundance in the blood. In other words, while you're eating and shortly after you have consumed a meal. And basically what insulin says to the body is use glucose preferentially as a source of energy and spare and store everything else. Use the amino acids to make proteins. Use fatty acids and glycerol to make triglycerides. And use glucose preferentially as a source of energy. So what stimulates the release of insulin? Well, as food enters the stomach and small intestine, cells in the walls of these organs release hormones, and these hormones cause the beta cells of the pancreas to release insulin. Also, as carbohydrate is absorbed by the small intestine, blood glucose levels rise, and this also stimulates the release of insulin by the beta cells. So insulin is released in response to a hormonal stimulus, the gut hormones, and by a humoral stimulus, a rise in blood glucose levels. Insulin is a protein, and proteins are hydrophilic. Therefore, insulin cannot cross the plasma membrane, and therefore must bind receptors on the extracellular face or surface of the plasma membranes of its target cells. Once insulin binds its receptors, it promotes the use of glucose for energy and the storage of other nutrients. In fat cells, muscle cells, and liver cells, glucose increases the facilitated diffusion of glucose into these cells. By increasing the number of glucose transporters in the plasma membranes of these cells. So the more glucose transporters you have, the greater the movement of glucose from the extracellular fluid into the cytoplasm of these cells. In liver cells, once glucose enters the liver cells, the glucose is used to make the storage form of glucose, which is glycogen. Glycogen can be used later between meals to uh, release glucose into the blood. Insulin also stimulates fat synthesis and reduces the breakdown of fat in the liver. Glucose also promotes the production of protein from amino acids in most cells of the body. And lastly, 
insulin stimulates the oxidation of glucose to make ATP in most cells of the body. So when you look at the overall effect of glucose, it causes the cells of the body to preferentially use glucose as a source of energy while causing the storage of amino acids in the form of protein, of fatty acids in the form of triglycerides, and in the liver it causes the storage of some glucose in the form of glycogen to be used later. Because insulin promotes the uptake of glucose from the blood by fat cells specifically and liver cells and muscle cells, it causes a decrease in blood sugar levels, reducing them to the normal range. As blood sugar levels fall, there is a reduction in the secretion of glucose in a classic negative feedback mechanism. And when you look at the effect of glucose overall, it is anabolic. Yes, there's an increase in the production of energy from glucose, but there is an increase in the storage of amino acids in the form of protein and an increase in the storage of fat in the form of triglycerides from fatty acids. So overall, the effects of insulin are anabolic for the body to store energy. Now that we have discussed insulin, let's now turn our attention to glucagon. Glucagon is often referred to as the hormone of fasting, and that is because secretion of glucagon increases as blood glucose levels fall. And blood glucose levels typically fall when you are between meals or you haven't eaten in a while. Thus, glucagon is the hormone of fasting. Now, unlike insulin, the effects of glucagon are pretty much restricted to the liver. So liver cells are principally the target cells of glucagon. Glucagon, like insulin, is a protein and therefore binds receptors on the extracellular face of its of the plasma membrane of its target cells. Once glucagon binds receptors uh, on liver cells, what's the effect? Well, it promotes the synthesis and release of gluco glucose. And how does it do it? Well, it causes the liver cells to break down the glycogen stores to release glucose into the blood. And if glycogen stores are not sufficient to raise blood glucose levels appropriately, glucagon also causes the creation of glucose from amino acids. These two processes or steps raise blood glucose concentrations. Now what if there is not sufficient glucose being provided by these two mechanisms to provide sufficient or raise blood glucose levels sufficiently? Glucagon also stimulates the production of ketone bodies from fatty acids. Now, what I want you to know about ketone bodies is that ketone bodies are acids, and therefore they potentially can reduce blood pH levels. And one of those ketone bodies is a substance called acetone, and acetone has a very sweet and strong smell to it. It's one of the main ingredients in fingernail polish removal, or at least it used to be. After discussing insulin and glucagon, you now realize that insulin and glucagon play a vital role in maintaining homeostasis of normal blood glucose levels. This figure from another book illustrates this. So let's say that you eat four jelly donuts. So you have this large absorption of glucose into your blood. So blood glucose levels rise. The rise in blood glucose levels causes the beta cells of the pancreas to release insulin. Insulin targets fat cells and muscle cells, causing them to increase their uptake of glucose. 
and it also causes liver cells to increase their uptake of glucose to, to store it as glycogen. This increase in uptake of glucose by fat cells, muscle cells, liver cells, and other cells as well causes a decline in blood glucose levels. This decline in blood glucose levels reduces further secretion of insulin. Now let's say that you spend the next six hours feverishly studying for your next A&P exam. So you aren't eating anything, and so your blood sugar levels begin to fall. The reduction in blood sugar levels causes the alpha cells of the pancreas to release glucagon. Glucagon targets the liver cells and causes glycogen stores to be broken down to release glucose into the blood. If there aren't sufficient glycogen stores, amino acids will be used to make glucose. But nevertheless, the liver is going to secrete and release glucose in the blood and that will increase blood sugar levels back to the normal range. As blood sugar levels increase, that reduces the stimulus that causes that caused glucagon to be, to be released in the first place, and so glucagon secretion will decrease as a result of the negative feedback mechanism. Now that you have a basic understanding of insulin and glucose, I'd like to talk a little bit about diabetes mellitus. Now, I do not often require students to know and understand diseases. However, this one is so common in our society and the risks of having diabetes mellitus are increasing, not decreasing. Therefore, I think it's appropriate to talk a little bit about this disease. Diabetes mellitus is a result either in the deficiency of insulin production, your beta cells aren't producing enough of it, or they're producing enough of it, but for whatever reason, the target cells don't respond to insulin normally. In either case, the result is a rise in blood glucose levels to abnormally high levels. Now, when you look at the word diabetes mellitus, diabetes comes from the Latin word diabenign, which means go through, and mellitus from, is the Latin word for sweet. So literally, it means to go through sweet. And what that refers to is the fact that with diabetes mellitus, if it's untreated, the patient produces a large amount of urine and that urine contains glucose. So they have a lot of sweet fluid that is passing through them, so to speak, thus the term diabetes mellitus. Now there are two types of diabetes mellitus. Type 1 diabetes usually develops during childhood or in some cases early adulthood and historically it's been called uh, early onset or childhood onset diabetes. In type 1 diabetes for whatever reason the immune system of the individual attacks the beta cells of the pancreas and destroys them. Therefore the individual can't make sufficient amounts of insulin. Because of uh, the lack of insulin production, they have to have an exogenous or outside source of insulin. So uh, type 1 diabetics are often referred to as insulin dependent diabetics. Now, the type 1 accounts for less than 10% of cases. Most people with diabetes have type 2. 90% of the cases are type 2, in fact. Here, the individual has intact beta cells, and those beta cells produce insulin. But for whatever reason, the target cells don't respond normally to the insulin. So the insulin is there, the receptors are there, but when the insulin binds the receptors, nothing happens. Or uh, there are changes, but not to the level that 
normally occurs. Now there are different theories on how why people develop type 2 diabetes long-term consumption of simple sugars if you're a kind of person who likes to eat a lot of sweets and you do that so you have a couple of sodas a day uh, over 30 40 years that appears to increase your risk of diabetes probably the number one greatest risk of developing diabetes is associated with obesity people who are obese more than 20 percent above your what's considered your normal uh, weight you are high risk to develop type 2 diabetes particularly if you develop abdominal fat it used to be that type 2 diabetes was considered adult onset diabetes but we're seeing uh, higher risk of developing type 2 diabetes in younger and younger uh, kids now and that is associated with an increase in childhood obesity so what are the long-term consequences of untreated or not effectively treated diabetes mellitus well over the long term diabetes can cause complications that can significantly reduce one's quality of life and can result in death so if you have elevated blood sugar levels over the long term it causes the production of abnormal glycoproteins and these glycoproteins damage blood vessels damage to blood vessels is going to reduce the ability of blood to flow through these blood vessels that can lead to all types of cardiovascular diseases it can cause angina it can cause a myocardial infarction atherosclerosis the narrowing of the arteries uh, and along with narrowing of the arteries and a reduction in flow of blood through the arteries co uh, comes hypertension and then hypertension itself can cause all kinds of complications damage to blood vessels that feed the brain can cause stroke damage to blood vessels that supply neurons and nerves causes neuropathy damage to blood vessels of the kidneys damages the ability of the kidneys to function requiring dialysis and in some cases requiring a kidney transplant damage to the blood vessels of the eye can cause loss of vision and even blindness so I cannot underscore how important it is to treat effectively diabetes if one has diabetes even if you feel good long term significant damage can be done to the body resulting in a decrease in quality of life and potentially death now let's review the objectives of this screencast for insulin and glucagon describe the following stimulus of secretion chemistry whether it's hydrophilic or hydrophobic target tissue and effect and regulation describe type 1 and type 2 diabetes and list the long-term consequences of untreated diabetes mellitus the topic of our next screencast will be the gonadotropins